All right, now, what we're preaching about tonight, we're going to get into to Luke 12 in just a few minutes, but um, the title of my sermon is Managing Your Investments. Okay, now, my, I'll tell you, I'm going to tell you the goal right up front because I want to kind of keep this as a theme to be, to be thinking about this throughout the sermon. And it's really just a challenge to make you think about your time and think about everything that you do in the form of an investment. That's, and, you know, think about what is an investment. You're investing something. Now, normally when you hear the word investment, automatically you're thinking financial. You're thinking that it's money is going into something. And that is one type of an investment, right? A financial investment. You have a bunch of money, you put it in the stock market, and it's you know, going to make some money for you, hopefully, and that's what you do with it. But I'm speaking much broader today. We're going to go into finances a little bit, but I'm just speaking in general with investments of your time, your energy, your resources, your money, whatever it is that you have. What are you spending your time on and what ought you to be spending your time on? So we're going to be looking at how we should be managing our investments tonight. Now, as with all investments that you have, regardless of the type, whatever it is you're investing in, your resources are limited. So financially, if we're talking about money, if it's a financial investment, you only have so much money. I mean, I don't care if you have, if you're the richest person in the world, you still have a limited amount of resources. Now your limit may be really high, it may be really low, it may be in the middle, whatever. Wherever you're at, it doesn't really matter. We have to first of all just understand that our resources are limited and because our resources are limited, we need to prioritize very wisely. Um, you only make you know, X amount of dollars a week. So when we're speaking financially, a budget will help you to determine you know, what is the most important thing and what deserves those resources that you have. So we're getting into finances just a little bit. You know, um, money's important. It's not the most important thing in the world, but obviously dealing with money is an important part of our lives. We deal with it every day. We need it to buy food and clothing and, and everything else that we need in life. We use money as the medium to, to um, attain these things. And because of this, I'm going to start off with this aspect. Money is pretty tangible. And there's also certain principles that are good principles to follow when it comes to managing your money and your finances that can be applied to all the other areas too because really what we're talking about is just a management of, of resources. <laughs> and again, it could be money, it could be time, it could be whatever. And um, so when you make a budget for yourself, you think, okay, you have to prioritize. What are the most important things that require the money that I earn? Right? And, and a pretty obvious one that's going to be at the top of the list is going to be food, right? We need, we need food and water because we need to survive. So when you go through and you make a budget, and a budget's a good idea because a lot of people get into trouble financially. And again, we're starting with the finances, but we're going to be applying this to other areas too. And people could be getting in trouble in other areas as well because they're not applying these basic principles that are important to have in order to, to get things under control. Money is real easy. We all understand it. So we're starting with that. Um, when you make a budget for yourself, you know, typically people know about how much they make. You know, most people are salaried or hourly to a point where, okay, you know, I'm making this amount of money a week or every two weeks or every month or whatever that may be. Um, now it's going to take a little time and a little bit of effort, but it will do, it'll serve you very well to sit down and say, okay, Based on this amount of money, what are we going to spend our money on? It needs to be prioritized. Otherwise, you can just, I mean, if you just go shopping and it's, oh, I think I want this. Oh, I think I want that. Oh, I think, you know, that's going to get you into trouble. Unless you have a very, very high resource limit. Most people I know don't have just a very, you know, it doesn't really matter. But even people who have a lot of money, I mean, the things that they tend to get cost a lot of money too. So that, you know, the, 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 the money spend and the money in is kind of close to, to being equal. And if you end up spending more than you're bringing in, you're going to get yourself in a lot of trouble and debt and that's somewhere where you don't want to be. So you make a budget very simply, a very simple concept of just saying, okay, I make this, you know, uh, $500 a week or whatever. We need to eat. We need to, to provide shelter. We need clothing. You know, we need these things. 
and then you can start allocating, okay, this much money goes to this, this much money goes to this, and then you know where everything's at, and um, that will help you to, um, you know, to, for one, to be able to get the things that you want and need and be able to plan appropriately. It's going to keep you from going into debt and having all kinds of other problems, but it also makes you think about, well, what are our priorities? What is important? And this is, this is going to be kind of a main theme throughout this sermon is what, what is important to you? Now, as with any investment, there's, um, there's something that's called an ROI. It's your return on your investment, right? So when you invest time, resources, money, anything, whatever, into a certain investment, you're expecting a return. You're expecting to get something back, right? So um, an example, obviously working at your job to provide basic necessities is going to be a high priority. And, um, but continuing to invest beyond that, you have to think about what is the return? You know, is the time that you spend at work only worth money that, you know, because you're, what you're doing when you work, you're exchanging your time, you're exchanging your energy to get some money to get paid because obviously the money you need to, to provide everything else. So you have to be able to figure, well, how much can I work? Because people get, can get two jobs. People can work more. You know, there's, there's, you have so much time. Now, everybody's limited on time. Time is a resource. It doesn't matter who you are. Everybody has the same amount of time, hours in a day, you know. And again, this is another area where you, need, you, should, you ought to take a look at it and say, how much time do I have? What am I doing with my time? If you work... Okay, well, I need to work. I need to make this much money to pr you know, provide for our needs or I'm making this much money and allocate it. Um, it's a better way to do it, but you can say, well, I can work more. I can add eight hours. I can get another job. I can do this or that. What is that going to get you? And um, again, this has to come from you determining what is important to you, where your value is at. Um, analyze your own life and make sure you're investing of yourself according to your priorities. So step number one is going to be to establish your priorities just in general. What is important to you? What types of things um, do you want to be spending your time on? What types of goals do you want to accomplish? What, what do you want to do with your life in general, with your day-to-day -day life, your activities? What types of things are priorities to you? And then step number two is to designate the resources that you have. Mostly it's going to be time, but also money and financial things and, and, and whatever. Um, you have to designate the resources you have and then finally monitor your investments and make sure that they're working out the way that you, you want them to. Now, one thing that I do with, with my financial budget is, you know, as I mentioned, we have all the, we have the bills laid out. We have all these other expenses um, that are kind of static. They're standard and say, okay, yeah, well, we want to have heat. We have enough money to afford having the heat, having the electric, having the, you know, all these different things that are pretty common in the United States for living. And then our food and that type of stuff. But we also like, one of the things that's a priority for us is, is our tithe. You know, that money belongs unto God. That's a priority. Obviously serving God, doing what's right in God's eyes. Everything, whenever we're looking at our time, whenever we're looking at resources, our energy, God is like number one. He's the top priority in our lives. So, we, every time, no matter what it is we're doing, we're going to analyze, is this right? Is this good? Is this something I should be, is this wise to be spending my time or resources in this way um, according to God's view? So with financial purposes, when we're just focusing on our fin finances, we say, okay, well, the tithe belongs unto God. That's his. We're going to pay that first. That comes right off the top. And then whatever's left is the money that we use to allocate for other things. Makes sense, right? We have a, a mortgage, a, you know, a house payment. That's, that's a very important thing as well. Food. You know, all these things are very important. Now, we're going to look here at Luke number 12 because having said all of that, I honestly, I don't think that finances ought to be a very high priority. So we're going to look at some verses. And again, you, you decide for yourself. We're going to look at some Bible to help you to get the proper priorities and, to, and to, to be able to make these decisions for yourself of how much should I be working. Like for me especially, I have a relatively flexible job where I can work a little bit less or work a little bit more. And, and the more I work, the more I'll end up getting paid. And 
it's a very important distinction for me to, to do this. And you know, other people are in the same situation where you might have that opportunity to work more. But what are you giving up as a result of that? And what are you gaining as a result of that? You know, when, when I'm trying to work harder, what is it for? And I have to ask myself these very questions. What am I getting out of this? Why am I working? You know, what is the purpose that I have to work that much harder? Is it just to get extra money just for the sake of having extra money? Is it, is it you know, what, what am I going to use with that? What's it, what's it going to? But look at Luke 12, where we read, verse number 15. The Bible says, and this is a very uh, critical verse to understand for our lives, and he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. So the amount of stuff that you have, the things that you can accumulate, that's not what your life's all about. That's what the Bible says. This is important to understand this priority because so many people are wrapped up in the things of this world, are wrapped in, in, up in being able to afford these things and be able to afford the boats and the campers and the, the vacation houses and all of this other stuff. And there's nothing sinful about working hard and buying things. But where is your priority at? And that's, and, you know, a lot of things I'm going to be covering tonight, they're not necessarily sins. Okay, now covetousness is a sin, but working hard and setting aside a, a, part, a part of budget and, and putting money aside and stuff for that to, to a, accomplish or purchase something that you would like to have and you have a goal and a plan for it that's not sinful, but is it really worth your time? Is it really worth the extra energy? Is it worth whatever it is that you have to put in in order to get that benefit? Our life is not about these, these physical things. Look at verse number 16. He says, uh, he goes into this parable. He says, and he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now we see here this parable. It says, Guy, he's already pretty wealthy. He's already has his storehouses full. Right? So what does he decide to do with his wealth? He says, Well, I'm just going to pull these down and just accumulate even more. I'm just going to make sure, I'm going to fill up all of these storehouses, you know, and, and make sure that I'm just set for the rest of my life and then I can just take it easy. I won't have to work. I'll just, just enjoy life. I'll eat, drink, and be merry. But look what God says. God says, you're a fool. He says, you're a fool. You spend all this time and all these resources just to amass and accumulate all this wealth that you have so you can retire early, so you don't have to worry about working. And he says, you know, basically, your soul is required of you this night. You're going to die. And then what's going to happen to your stuff? All this stuff that you worked for, that you thought you were going to take it, be on easy street for the rest of your life, gone. You're gone. Where is it going to go to now? means nothing. It's, it's vanity. It's fruitless. And he says, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And that's key there because he says, it's not just the laying up the, the, you know, the treasure for yourself, but it's, it's the and is not rich toward God. So if someone works and that, you know, you have a savings account, you're putting away some money, fine, but you're, you know, like you're serving God and you're rich towards God and, and that's your priority and that's your focus then the, the having that extra wealth and those other things that are going on, it's not a big deal, right? Because that's off on the side. You, you still have your priorities rich towards God and serving God. Now, this guy, I mean, and you know, most of us might not be able to relate to, to a rich man, someone like this, being in a situation, but think about what he could have done with that stuff. He didn't have to just save it all up for himself and hoard it all and, and just be focused on himself and not being able to do things for other people. There's so many other things he could have done with his time and his energy, especially at this point in the game when he's already set. He's already comfortable. Um, we'll finish reading up here. It says in verse number 22, and he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say it unto you, take no thought for your life. What ye shall eat, Neither for the body what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. 
And that should hopefully help put things in perspective too because he's saying don't even worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear. He's saying don't worry about it. Now, of course, we need to work to, to be able to eat. So I'm not saying, oh, don't worry about it in the sense of just don't even get a job and just forget about it and just, just pray that God will take care of you. No, you need to work. But um, in terms of what the first Timothy chapter number five, we're going to see our responsibility to work in first Timothy chapter five, especially as men, right? The man is supposed to provide for the household. But um, it shouldn't be so much of a concern. And oftentimes it is. I know it's been a big concern in my life as a man trying to provide. But um, he's essentially saying, you know, God's going to take care of you. If you're, if you're working and serving God and seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things are going to be added unto you. God knows your needs. God's going to take care of you, but it requires faith. God doesn't want us just completely stressing out over the money, over the food, over the clothing. If you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, if you're serving God, if you're working hard, he'll take care of you. And we need to, to keep this in our minds, again, as we're budgeting, as we're allocating our time and our resources and our investments, um, we need to remember that God has already promised to take care of us. Is it important? Yes. But is it the most important thing we ought to be focused on? No. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse number 8 says, But if any provide not for his own house, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. An infidel is someone who doesn't believe in God, right? So an infidel is like a heathen who doesn't believe in God. He says he's worse than an infidel if, uh, if someone doesn't provide for his own family, especially those of his own house. So obviously, working and providing for your family is important to God. And it is, should be important to us. But um, we're going to see some other verses here now too. And you don't have to turn to these places, but the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.10, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. So do we need to work in order to eat? Yes, of course we do. This is something that we have to do. It's something that we ought to do, and we ought to make sure we're putting aside enough time to do this appropriately. But the Bible also says in Proverbs 23, verse 4, Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. You know, the world's wisdom is going to tell you that you ought to, you know, everyone should work and just get rich, and that's the, your success in life is just in getting rich. He says in verse 5, Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. The riches that you get, they're going to go away. It's vanity. It's worthless. It's going to be gone. He's saying labor not to be rich. So don't put all of your time and effort and energy into getting rich. It's worthless. And then in John 6, verse 27, the Bible says, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. So, again, just a recap here with financial um, investments. We can see here, yes, of course, it's important. Yes, we need to provide food. Yes, we need to provide clothing. Yes, we need to provide things for our family. And it is very important to do those things. But we got to make sure we don't get too carried away that we have the right priorities that come from the Bible and that um, we're not emphasizing the money too much. It's easy to get sucked into that, that type of a trap of just focusing on how much money you make in order to just um, you know, up your standard of living or whatever. Now we're going to talk about another type of investment, a very, very important type of investment, which is children and your family. And, and um, the more time you, you spend with your children, it's a very wise investment, right? And remember, we talked um, earlier about, uh, about the ROI, the return on your investment. Well, with your, with your finances, with, with your work, the return on your investment is, uh, you know, the more time you spend at work, the more money you should be getting back. So you get that return. Now, that return is an immediate return. That's something that, okay, I'm going to work harder. I'm going to add extra hours. Well, then immediately I'm getting that paycheck right back and I could use those resources immediately. It's, it's something that happens right away. But your children, it doesn't work that way. And I believe that every... It, uh, one of the best investments of the, of the best uses of your time is going to return something that's not going to be an immediate 
uh, benefit to you. It's not going to be something that you're going to see right away. You're not going to see the fruit of it and the results of it immediately. Just like the tree, just like a seed you plant in the ground, you know, the benefit doesn't come right away. It's not like, hey, I'm going to plant this apple seed in the ground and tomorrow we're just going to have like, like hundreds of apples to eat from. No. You plant the seed in the ground and it takes years. Years and years to grow and to be nurtured and time spent on it and work and make sure everything's going well and, and do what you need to be done to make sure that that tree is growing and being healthy. But then in the end, you know, after, after the decade or whatever, I don't, I, don't, I don't know, don't quote me on these statistics. I don't know that much about apple trees, except that we have one in the front yard and it still doesn't really produce that many apples. But um, it takes a while for these things to grow. But then once they do, once they come to fruition, once it's time for them to start returning, then they become really fruitful and you get a lot back off of just that one little seed. But it took time, it took energy, and, and it took a while. Now, with your children, it's the same way. If you raise godly children, if you raise them according to the way the Bible says, then they, they will be, um, they will honor their father and their mother. Like the Bible says, if you're teaching them God's word, if you get them, you know, if they get saved young and you're able to, to just train them, teach and train a, trial, a child in the way he shall go, and when he's older, he should not depart from it. When they, when they get old enough, you know, they're, they're, they'll love you. They'll um, be able to then take care of you when, it's your, when it comes out to be your time of need. And that's one investment that you won't get until much, much later on in your life. But if you do a good job from the beginning, your children will love you and respect you and will do other things then to, to come back and take care of you in your time of need. Now, um... Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter number six, because with your children, the investment is, is, it's time for sure, but it's not just your time. Obviously, we need to make sure we're doing things the right way, and it all, everything's always coming back to the Bible. How should we be doing this? How should we be teaching? Now, I, um, I'm not going to go into the discipline very much this morning, or right tonight, because I did this morning about um, the, the chastising and the spanking and the ways that you need to discipline your child because those are all very important and you need to have proper discipline. It needs to be consistent. You can't be lazy about it. You know, if this is an important investment, you're investing in the future of lives of these children. Being lazy with your, with your investment, being lazy with your resources, it's, it's not going to do any good. You're not going to get the results that you want. Um, but not just the discipline. Now we're going to talk about some of the teaching and training of the children. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 6. The Bible says, And these words, which I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Abigail, sit up. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. And when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. This is obviously talking about the importance of God's word and learning and teaching God's word. Because he's talking about, you know, you need to teach your children diligently. Diligently doesn't mean whenever it's convenient. Diligently doesn't mean, well, I've got all this other stuff to do, and when I get around to it, then I'm going to teach the children the Bible. Then I might talk about God's Word. No, diligently means I'm focused on this. I'm going to make sure if they do nothing else, if I do nothing else, they're going to learn this. This will happen. This is a priority. And that's why he says, diligently shall talk of them when thou sittest down in the house. Hey, when you sit down, do you ever talk about the Bible? How about when you walk by the way? You go on a walk, you take the dogs on a walk, you go out, do you talk about the Bible? When you lie down, when it's time for bed, do you talk about the Bible? Do you talk about God's Word? Do you talk about God's commandments? When you get up in the morning, is that even a thought? This is how you teach your children diligently. He's giving us the model. He's giving us the mold saying, look, you need to be talking about the Word of God all the time. It needs to sink in. It needs to get through. This isn't something that's just good enough to come 
to church on Sunday mornings and, well, that's their dose of God. That's their dose of learning about the Bible. No, this needs to be a continual thing. And you need to be willing to invest that time. This is, children is one of the most important investments that you could ever have in your entire life. Raising children is extremely important. And this is one of the few things that, it's, that is done. It's not just for the return that's coming back to you. It's, it's for their benefit. It's so that they can do well and that they can do another. Yeah, do you get something back out of this? Of course you do. You're going to get their love and affection. You're going to get, you know, if you, if you, um, you know, grow older and you need help, they'll be there to help you. But ultimately, the, the, the biggest goal is not a return on the investment that comes back to you. The return of investment comes back onto them. We need to train the children so that they don't end up making the mistakes that could destroy their lives. That they don't get into all the sins that maybe their parents have gotten into or that other people get into and all the problems and the, the mistakes and, and all the, the, the disappointments and destruction and, and sadness and grief that goes along with living a life of, life of sin. That they can live a righteous type of life because they've learned God's word, because it's been, been integrated into their life so much that they, they know it. And they understand it and um, it will help them quite a bit. And that's where the return comes in. They learn it at a young age. Well, when they get older, they won't depart. And, and that will be a tremendous help for them. Time isn't the only thing when it comes to children. The quality of your time is also important. You know, sitting next to your child on the couch and both of you just planting your eyes on a screen and just sitting there is not quality time spent with your child. It's time, yes, it's your resources, but how is that time being spent? Is it valuable? Is it, is it doing anything? It doesn't yield the same reward as taking the same amount of time and engaging with your children and actively teaching them or even just talking and communicating and building bonds and relationships with them when you just sit down in front of a video game or sit down in front of a TV or, or whatever. You know, we need to be analyzing the things that we do and prioritizing what's important. Is God's word important? It ought to be important in their discipline. It ought to be important in their teaching and in everything else. And then... Um, one more area that I kind of want to touch on tonight as an investment is, is just God in general, okay? Investing in the things of God. And there's, this encompasses everything. Now, God definitely deserves his own category. However, God's so big, he encompasses all of the other categories too, right? Whether it be finances, whether it be children, whether it be anything in your life. Now, we all have a lot of other things that, that are a part of our lives. I'm just picking these three as three main points that we can go over. But... Um, God should encompass and, and get into all of these areas. But with God, you're mainly managing your resource of time. So how much time do you invest in Bible reading? Now, Bible reading, when you invest time in that, that's going to give you a return of more knowledge, more knowledge about God, more knowledge about the things that you ought to do, which is going to help you then to make the right decisions in your life to move forward. There's, there's a value to this. How important is that to you? Think about it. How important is it to you to not make mistakes under critical decisions that you have to make? How important is that? Like, the, how, how many mistakes do you want to make in your life? Well, however important that is should be indicated to you by how much time you're going to invest into reading and giving time to study and prayer and church attendance attendance and, you know, getting sin out of your life. All of these things require time and effort on your part. And soul winning. How important is it to you that people get saved? How important is it to you that people don't go to hell? How important is it to you what your treasure is going to be like in heaven? How important are all these things to you? And only you can answer that. You know, this, this, I want you thinking about these things for your own life so that if something is lacking, if you say, you know what, this is important to me, but I'm not really doing anything about it. I want you to make the change today. I want you to think about it and say, you know what, no, th this really is important, but I'm not doing enough for this. I need to make a change in my schedule. I'm doing this other thing that really isn't important at all. 
that really is just meaningless and vain. Maybe I should substitute that for something that I actually do consider to be very important, something I actually do believe in, something that, that is, I do know that the results are there, even if they don't come immediately. They're there. You know, the Bible actually gives us a pretty good roadmap for our life if we're willing to listen. There's so many answers found in this book. For example, let's take a young person trying to figure out what to do with their life. Just, just you know, a young, like an older teenager, right? A young adult. Well, the world's going to tell you all kinds of things. This is what the world's going to say for someone in, in that age group, right? They're going to say, you graduate high school, leave your parents, leave your father or mother, go to college. If you meet someone that you fall in love with, you know, these days, regardless of their gender, they're going to say, you know, don't rush into anything, move in together, feel it out, see how you're going to do, you know, see if you really like each other, and then maybe after a while of doing that, you should get married. And then they'll say, you know, and then don't have kids right away because you need some time to go and just do those, all those things you want to do by yourself. And you got to make sure that you're financially stable and that everything is just perfect and everything's just right before you could even start to think about having children. This is what the world's philosophy, the world's wisdom says to a young teenager these days. That's, that's, the, that's the life plan. That's the roadmap that they have laid out. Well, let's compare that to the Bible because the Bible actually has all the answers to these questions. The answer to what should a young person do with their life. Let's compare with the world's example with what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 19. And turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. In Matthew 19, verse 4, the Bible says, And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? So there you go, first of all, um, it's a man and a woman, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh what therefore God hath joined together let not man put asunder so um, you know when the world tells you oh yeah you should go off and move out of your house and go to college for four years and, and live that life that's not what the Bible says the Bible says for this cause what cause is that the cause of meeting a man or a woman that, that you love, that you want to marry. It says, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother. That's why you leave the house. That's why you leave your father and mother is to cleave unto your wife. And it says he made a male and female. Now, does that mean every single person has to get married? No, of course not. But that was the cause to leave the house. That was the cause to leave father and mother. You're in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Look at verse number 1. Now, you know, Apostle Paul kind of explains, we're not going to get through this entire chapter. He explains a little bit about getting married and not getting married. Girls, pay attention right now. He explains a lot about, you know, those that are married and those that are virgins and, and the kind of differences between them. And he says a little bit about God's laws. And then he says, well, this is my opinion right? And he says, this isn't quite commanded from God, but it's my opinion. But we're going to look at what he says here. Look at verse number one. He says, now concerning the things where he wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. So right off the bat, we see a difference here between the world's, you know, philosophies and God's approach. He says, look, a, it's good for man not to even touch a woman, but so that they don't fornicate. If that urge is there, if you, if you want to do that, get married first. Make sure you get married. Whereas the world's going to tell you, ah, you like someone, move in together, feel out, see how things go, and just commit all the fornication you want, so that way at least you're not getting married to someone you don't want to get married to if it doesn't work out for you. The Bible says, no. No, if you find someone that you love, then you know, you're attracted to, don't fornicate with that person. Get married and avoid the fornication. Jump down to verse number eight. He says, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I, but if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. So again, he's making a reference saying, look, you know, I think it, Paul's saying, you know, I think it's better for you if you're not married or if you're widows, just, just be like me. 
The Apostle Paul was not married. He dedicated his life to serving God. He did all kinds of great, immense work for the Lord, but he wasn't married. But he, see, he didn't have a problem with that either. He didn't have this burning and this lust towards, towards a woman that, that he just he had to get married to avoid fornication. And honestly, not everybody has that gift. And I don't remember if I have that, that verse um, quoted in my notes here. But he says that um, essentially you have to be capable of being a type of person that's not um, going to be tempted or prone to fornication with another person in order to even remain single. He says way better. He's like, just get married. You know, he's like, I think it's great. You know, if everyone can just be like me. But um, even still, he's not, that's not a commandment of God because obviously if everybody was like the Apostle Paul, then the whole world would cease to exist because no one would be married and no one would be having kids, right? I mean, if, if that was just the absolute way for everybody, which it's not because God didn't design that to be that way for everybody. Um, but um, jump down to verse number 34 because we say, okay, well, how should the unmarried live then, right? He say, well, you know, not everyone's getting married and that's fine. You don't, you don't have to get married. It's not a requirement. But then how should we live? Look at verse number 34. The Bible says, There is a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy, both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, that ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction. So he's saying here, look, the unmarried, you need to be, you know, you should care about the things of the Lord. You need to be holy, undefiled, both in body and in your spirit. Like, like that is what, what you're doing is you're dedicating your life to serving God the same way that the Apostle Paul did. And he says, and being unmarried, that way you can attend upon the Lord without any distractions. You don't have a husband, you don't have a wife, you don't have anyone else to have to worry about and take care of and, and, and love and do everything else that goes along with having a marriage. You can be completely dedicated unto serving God. Verse number 36, But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin, if she pass a flower of her age and need so require, let him do what he will. He sinneth not, let them marry. So the unmarried plan for the life is basically of service to God. It's, this is what you need to be doing. It's not this, you know, going out and living it up and partying and everything else. He's saying, no, just use that to not be distracted with anything else and to serve the Lord. So then how should the married live? Just should they, you know, like the, the world says, then should we just wait for children and, and just, you know, put everything off or you know, okay, I wanted to, to avoid fornication, so I got married, like the Bible says, but we're not really ready for children. We don't have that much money. You know, we're not very stable. Well, what does the Bible says it say about that? Look at verse number four. We'll go back to verse number four, 1 Corinthians 7. The Bible says, The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, Accept it be with consent for a time. And then you say, okay, well, yeah. So, you know, if my wife wants to lay with me, then I'm not going to deny her. If my husband wants to lay with me, I won't deny him. But, you know, okay, well, we still can't afford children, so we're just going to consensually just not have that relationship so we cannot have children. Well, let's keep reading here. Let's see if that's what he's talking about. He says, accept it be with consent for a time. And what's the, for the purpose of that? Of, of that not having that, in, that, that interaction. That ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So the whole purpose of that consent for a time is only for the fasting and prayer. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think I could fast for longer than you know a few days, maybe 30 if I was going to really stretch it out. But this is the extent of, and this is the only reason given that the consent can be for you not to defraud each other, to, to you know, consensually say, okay, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do this in our marriage. And he says, that is a legitimate reason. You're fasting, you're afflicting your soul, you're praying to God, but you're, I mean, you're withholding everything that would be like fleshly, fleshly appetites to have that that relationship as well as food, as well as other things. That's fine. 
But that is a very limited amount of time that you go in order to do those things. He says the rest of the time, hey, defraud you not one or the other. And he, and he said the reason is that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Otherwise, Satan's going to come in and start tempting you and, and start trying to you know, appeal to your lust and to commit adultery and, and other things then that is going to be um, improper and, and get you into even more trouble. So the Bible basically teaches that, no, you ought, if you're a husband and wife, you ought to have that relationship. And that's something that, that you need in your relationship to, to be able to have that type of um, that interaction with each other. It'll keep you close. It'll keep you loving each other. But, um, you know, the world's views, it doesn't, it doesn't line up. So anyways, let's get back to... Um, to our investments because that's you know you invest in a marriage you want you want your marriage to work obviously um, that's another big investment and this is one way we can see how you can make a proper investment into that marriage you need to spend time you need to spend your energy you know your resources on your wife on your spouse that you know even the apostle Paul says you know those are married you you know you're concerned about your husband you're concerned about their things and 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 their well-being not just on God Whereas if you're single, that should be your main focus. If you're married, that's not your total focus. Now, is God our primary focus? Yes. But is he the absolute only focus? No. If you're married, you, have, you, you focus on your wife as well. You focus on your children. You focus on other things. Because these things are important. God recognizes that. He understands that. He knows that to be true. The, the good thing is that, that he, you know, in so doing, you, you still are... are in good standing with God, you're right by God by taking care of your family, taking care of your children and your spouse and loving them because the Bible commands that too. So it is still all works together, but um, your wife, your spouse is a very important investment in your life. Make sure that you're, you know, again, not so focused on the money that you're just spending all of your time at work. You spend some time with your family. But, you know, we, we need to make sure it's, it's all a balancing act. It's all a game that we have to play in order to, to make sure that nothing is really lacking too much. Because there's a lot of stuff that, that, that is righteous and that we should be doing with our time. There's a lot of things you'd be spending your time doing, you know, between serving God, soul winning, reading your Bible, prayer, spouse, children, you know, work, all of these different things. They all need to be done. But we need to make sure that our priorities are right. And again, you, you know, without setting these for yourself and in your mind, this is what's important to me. It's going to be a lot harder for you. Your time's not going to be spent as well as you'd like it to be without that good plan. Now, um, so then what about leisure time, right? Now, I'm, I'm going to say right now, I don't think it's a sin to, to you know, reduce some stress every once in a while and, and to have a little bit of fun and to go out, but... Another thing a lot of people seem to live for and, and focus on is just those vacations and that fun and just going out and, and you know, doing whatever, going on a boat, going, you know, spending a day at the beach and going out and do those things. Now, if you do those things, again, I'm not saying it's a sin, but is that what you live for? Is that what you work for? Is that wh what your focus is on and saying like, man, I just, I need to keep working. I'm doing all this stuff just so I could go on vacation, just so I could go and spend my time doing nothing um, productive. But I, I get it. I realize, you know, sometimes as human beings, we need to be able to, to, to get that break every once in a while for, you know, just so that we could maintain our sanity and that our stress level isn't just through the roof. Um, it, it actually will help you. That's why God gave us the Sabbath, right? Um, to give us a day so we wouldn't just burn ourselves out. And God gave us, you know, gave the, the children of Israel the Sabbath to, to rest. And he says, you know, the, the resting is important. I want you to do this. And, um, you know, he says, you can work six days, but this day I want you to rest. And um, it's, it's some good advice. These, you know, it's not a commandment for us these days to keep the Sabbath, but, um, you know, getting that little bit of rest is important. It is important part of, of um, you know, maintaining your health. But again, where's the priorities at? Is that what you're always living for and always doing? Or is it something that is just a little bit lower on the, on the totem pole, and, so to speak, and, and you're, you're still maintaining focus on the most important things? Now, um, all the best investments are the ones that take a long time to reap the reward. You know, 
investing and making money, as I mentioned earlier, you're going to get that, that result immediately. But um, the godly investments, you know, God's going to multiply, he'll bless you and multiply the fruit of your labor um, if you're doing what's right. Now, the best investments are going to require a lot of your attention, a lot of your time. And the worst thing that you can do is quit when it gets hard, when it gets to be too much. I mean, think, we'll, we'll, this is going to be my last point, and we'll close with this. Think about a 401k, right? 401k is something you put away for retirement. And, you know, oftentimes, an employer will take it out of your check, and you could start off, you put a certain percentage of money away to, to build up for later. Now, if you consistently invest in something like that, it could just be a small amount. You say, like, I'm, I'm just going to do this, but I'm going to do it consistently. I'm going to do it every paycheck. I'm always going to be putting money. I'm always going to be putting money. I'm always going to be investing. I'm always going to be investing. I'm always going to be investing. It's not a huge investment, but I'm always doing it. It's consistent. Over time, that reward is going to be a lot higher than if you just say, oh, well, this is too much. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to quit investing in this. You know, if you quit investing in something like a 401k after five years, well, by the time it comes to collect your, your benefit, you didn't invest very much, you're going to be getting very little back. But if it, you just stayed consistent with it, you can reap a huge, you know, if you start putting something away like when you're young, like when you're 20 or 30, and, and just consistently just check after check after check after check after check, you're putting this away, hey, you get a big return back on that. And you know, I'm not saying this so much because, because of the money. I don't even honestly like, like care to, to build a retirement. I don't plan on retiring. I plan on working um, for the rest of my life. Now, obviously, I want to make sure that we're taken care of financially as much as, as much as possible, as well as my children. But I say that because quitting on any of your investments is going to guarantee you know, a, a much, much more diminished or no results of, uh, of fruit of that labor. But even if it's a little amount, if you can do it consistently over time, just like we do the Bible memory verses, it's, you know, it's two verses a week. It's not that much time out of your day or out of your week, especially. You think of all the hours in a week, how much time does it take to memorize two verses? But if you can stay consistent with that for your life, you could end up memorizing a huge portion of the Bible. So it's, it's one way to help you not be too... Um, overwhelmed with the amount of things that you do with your time and your resources when you have when you think about these goals you're like man I want to I would love to be able to memorize so much Bible I would love to be able to you know to read this much or, or, to, or to have the Bible read through man if I could say you know by the time I quit my life I've read the Bible a hundred times cover to cover right or something like that you could say well how can I do that it's it's gonna come mostly with just with the consistency and it doesn't even have to be a huge amount of time invested just if you're doing it over and over and over again. Because as you add up all of the little things, it turns out to be quite a bit of time. Um, the prayer, the Bible reading, um, whatever, I mean, spending time with your children, spending time with your family, all of those things are, are, are things that require attention. But we need to make sure that we have the proper priority set on these things. And, um, you know, last point, just think about tonight what you know what's important to you and um, if I touched on anything that you might think you're lacking in that you could improve on that you do agree is very important in your own life and you don't think you're spending enough time think about what you know and think about it realistically it's one thing to say oh yeah I need I need to do this I need to spend more time on this but then there's no plan it never happens you just say well it's just something I need to do Think more realistically. I know I need to do this and I want to do this. What else can I replace? How can I rearrange my schedule so that this gets done? How can I arrange my schedule so that I actually am going to spend time out sewing? How am I going to you know, change my schedule so that I actually do get this Bible reading done? How am I going to change my schedule so that these kids do get taught the Bible? Or what, you know, whatever, whatever it may be, plan it out and and you know, hopefully you could you can make that improvement so that you will receive that that return on your investment that you're investing the, the amount of time uh, and resources on the things that you deem to be very important. But let's uh, close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the Bible, Lord. Help us all to, to manage our lives appropriately and to um, prioritize the things 
in our life. There's so many things. I, I didn't even touch on, on half of the things it seems like on, in our lives that we deal with. But um, these principles are important for us to learn and, and not just learn, but to utilize in our life, dear God, that we could um, be as effective as possible in getting the most things done, accomplishing the most in our life, dear Lord, and that um, we could try to make sure that nothing is lacking um, that, that, are, that is important to us, dear Lord. And I pray that you please help us with this, help us to make the time, help us not to be, be lazy and not to just waste a bunch of the, the limited time that we have while on this earth, dear God. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.